There was once a kindly gentleman named Malcolm, who lived peacefully on a small estate with his daughter Arabella. The child's mother had passed away when the girl was very little, so although the man had many lovely memories of his wife, his daughter knew her only from his stories. Ah, she was beautiful and intelligent, he would tell little Arabella. All the other fellows in town wished for her hand, and I was the lucky one who won her heart, he would reminisce. The little girl loved hearing about her mother because it made her feel like she knew her, even though she was not there to see Arabella grow up. The gentleman and his daughter lived in a rambling old stone house that was just grand enough to entertain a few visitors, but not so enormous as to be pretentious. Arabella loved the mansion and its gardens. In particular, she was extremely fond of a special part of the courtyard that had been cared for by her mother. According to her father, his bride had loved nature, and she had spent many hours selecting the trees and flowers that would fill her little paradise. To make it even more enchanting for his love, Arabella's father had surprised her mother with a beautiful fountain, pretty stone benches, and an arbor. When his wife wasn't tending to it, she could often be found reading there for hours on end. Arabella inherited that love for the sweet little garden, and she took to spending time there when she wanted to find a quiet spot for reflection or just to feel closer to her mother. It seemed to her that of all the places on the estate, her mother's garden had the most delicate flowers, the most refreshing breezes, and the most fascinating animal visitors. She felt most relaxed in that perfect spot, just watching the bees as they danced through the blooms, or the leaves as they drifted into the fountain. It was a perfect respite from the world. Their home was a short distance from other respectable families, but they didn't tend to go visiting or socializing. Without a lady of the house to organize such things, Malcolm found it a bit awkward to go calling on his neighbors. As a result, Arabella learned to entertain herself. She had a faithful little dog named Henry, who kept her laughing with his silly antics and offered her adoring companionship. With that, she was content. As much as Malcolm's love for his late wife endured, he did grow a bit lonely after many years of life as a widower. When Arabella was fifteen, he began spending time with a widow named Lydia, who lived nearby. She was a very respectable lady, 
and handsome in a reserved sort of way. She had two daughters named Agnes and Imogen. Agnes was seventeen, and Imogen was almost the same age as Arabella. Although they were properly educated in the skills expected of young ladies, Arabella did not find them to be particularly stimulating company. Where Arabella might like to discuss books or horticulture, they would prefer local gossip. Where she might have thoughts to share about music, they preferred fashion. Arabella was polite to all of them for her father's sake, but she secretly found Agnes and Imogen a bit tedious. She reflected with disappointment that it was a shame they had so little in common because she would have liked to have had some close friends. Under these circumstances, she had to make an effort to appear happy when her father brought her the news that he and Lydia were to marry. She and her father were very close, having only had each other for company all these years, and she had mixed feelings about the match. On one hand, she genuinely wished for her father's happiness. On the other, it would be a new experience for her to share her home and her private world with three other women none of whom seemed to have much in common with her. Nonetheless, Arabella smiled bravely for her father and congratulated him, wishing him joy. The wedding of a widow and a widower was generally a quiet affair in those days. The match was privately made, and the lady and her daughters were soon installed at Malcolm's house. Although there were empty bedrooms available, some shuffling of chambers was inevitable. Arabella found that she felt obligated to politely offer her own room which was one of the largest in the house, to Agnes. At seventeen, her new stepsister was, after all, the oldest young lady. Rather than graciously thanking Arabella for the swap, Agnes seemed to think the larger room was her due she unceremoniously moved in, spreading her things everywhere in a jumble. Arabella managed to tamp down her own annoyance as the new occupant made a mess of her childhood retreat. Instead, she tried to focus on making her smaller chamber a cosy getaway. While it wasn't the grandest space in the house, it had a charming window seat that overlooked her mother's garden, and the furnishings were pretty, having been chosen by her mother long ago. Meanwhile, Imogen moved into a similar room across the hall. Arabella caught glimpses through the open door and noted that she was as careless with her things as her sister was. 
dresses, shoes, and jewelry were simply piled about, although there was a notable absence of any books. Imogen showed little interest in getting to know her new stepsister, or in sharing any confidences with her. The two girls kept to themselves, Arabella in her tidy room, with her neat array of clothing and books, and Imogen in her own chaotic chamber, where she seemed to spend most of her time trying new hairstyles and fussing with her outfits. The addition of three demanding new ladies stretched Malcolm's resources. Arabella had grown up with a very small household staff. There was a kindly woman from the village who came to make dinner each day. She also had a daughter named Clara who was a sweet and industrious girl. Clara served as a maid, helping with any household task that needed doing. Since it was just the two of them living there, Malcolm and Arabella had a friendly, easy relationship with both Clara and her mother. There was no point in formality. As soon as they had settled in, the three new family members began to feel comfortable asserting themselves. They thought nothing of bothering Clara to bring their breakfast up on a tray instead of appearing in the dining room. They dropped their personal items wherever they liked and expected them to be magically returned to their rooms. They even diverted Clara from her usual duties to help with their clothes or their hair. These were things they could have done perfectly well for themselves, but they fancied themselves to be very grand. They expected Clara to act as a lady's maid on top of her usual work. Although she was a hard-working girl, she was not trained in the ways of hairstyling, nor was she an expert seamstress. Arabella tried to surreptitiously pitch in, lending a hand with any particularly tricky sewing and handling chores Clara couldn't complete. But Lydia was soon complaining to Malcolm that her daughters needed a proper maid who could make them look their best. After all, they would soon be ready to find husbands. In truth, Malcolm didn't understand why she was making such a fuss. He and his daughter had done just fine by themselves. Arabella had never seemed to need a special lady's maid, and he thought, She always looked wonderful. Nonetheless, he wished to make his new bride happy. He promised her that he would make inquiries on his next business trip, hoping to bring an experienced maid from the city. This appeased Lydia to some extent, but she began badgering him to plan his next trip soon. After all, she said petulantly, 
she couldn't be expected to continue depending on that girl from the village to keep the ladies of the house looking up to standard. It was never clear to Arabella if her father's announcement of a new business venture was due to his own ambitions or those of his wife, but Malcolm soon revealed to the family that he would be setting off on an overseas journey. A trusted friend had invited him to join in on a new investment, he told them over dinner. It was nearly sure to be very profitable, he assured them. However, he needed to travel to a far country in order to make the proper arrangements. He expected to be gone for a couple of months. Arabella was quiet during the rest of the meal, as her stepmother and stepsisters showered Malcolm with requests for gifts and exotic goods that he might bring them. Lydia put on a somewhat unconvincing attitude of being sad that he was leaving but her obvious delight that he would finally engage a new maid eclipsed her paltry show of regret. For her part, Arabella was dreading months of being cooped up with only her stepmother and stepsisters for company. Furthermore, she was worried about the running of the house. How would things be managed in his absence? After dinner, the two of them took a quiet turn together in her mother's garden. Malcolm held both of her hands in his and looked her directly in the eye. He told her that he knew she was prepared to take care of the estate while he was gone. He would be leaving them ample funds to support them for even longer than he expected to be away. Although Lydia would be officially in charge of his affairs during that time, he acknowledged that his new wife had little interest in official business. He was confident Arabella could keep the household running behind the scenes. Arabella was both flattered and nervous about the confidence he placed in her. It was true She knew the house inside out, and she was on excellent terms with their small staff. She had learned from Malcolm at an early age, following his lessons on money. Most importantly, she was a sensible girl and a quick study. Nonetheless, it felt like a large responsibility. The day of his departure came all too soon. As if in sympathy with his daughter's feelings, the early spring skies were dark and rainy. While a carriage waited, the women of the household stood on the front stairs, holding up shawls to shelter from the rain. After a somewhat formal farewell, Lydia turned brusquely and went inside. Agnes and Imogen rushed after her with relief. 
But Arabella hugged her father close, clinging to him as if she could stop him from going. He patted her on the back, reassuring her that all would be well, and she bravely released him. Standing up straight, heedless of the soaking downpour, she smiled. Not to worry, she told him. I'll take care of everything until you return. His face showed his love for her as he waved goodbye and climbed into the hired carriage. Then she watched it until it was no more than a small dot on the road. The tempestuous March and April days turned to a balmy summer. Occasionally, a letter would arrive from Malcolm in which he detailed his foreign travels. The going was hard at times, he reported but he was also experiencing exotic places he had never expected to see. In June, as the idyllic summer weather rested gently over the countryside, Malcolm sent a communique to tell them his travels had been extended. He apologized greatly but promised it would be worth the trouble, and he enclosed funds to keep the household running for another two months. The new influx of money was a huge relief to Arabella, who'd been nervously watching the last of the household budget disappear. To her consternation, however, Lydia seized upon the funds immediately, stating imperiously that Agnes and Imogen desperately needed new clothes. Although the family was located outside of town, there was still a social season to consider and Agnes was ready to be out in society, she said. Arabella was hesitant to argue with Lydia, but she felt she must speak up. She politely suggested that there were some urgent household concerns that must be dealt with first. The servants needed to be paid, and the larder was growing rather empty. A man from the village was needed to come and tend to some repairs. Would it not be wiser, she said, to take care of those items first? Lydia's reaction to her stepdaughter's boldness was angry and swift. She icily informed Arabella that she would spend the money as she saw fit, and that a fifteen-year-old girl would not school her in how to run a proper household. Further, she advised that if Arabella was so concerned about the cost of the staff, they should let Clara go, and Arabella could take over her duties. At this, Agnes and Imogen dissolved into fits of laughter. Why don't you start by cleaning the fireplace in my room, Imogen said, with a spiteful edge to her voice. What a good idea. Agnes responded haughtily. I know. 
we could just call her Cinderella. Both of her stepsisters found this very funny and happily began to speculate about what other jobs their Cinderella could do. Arabella left the room without another word. She rushed down the hall and retreated to her bedroom with her faithful little dog Henry on her heels. Once there, she threw herself into the window seat and leaned her head against the glass, staring at her mother's garden. How very unfair it all was, she said tearfully to Henry, who cocked his head to the side sympathetically. Why couldn't mother still be here? Why did father have to go off on this long trip? She sat there, stroking his soft fur and watching the twilight gradually fall outside. Eventually, she drifted off to sleep. When Arabella awoke in the morning, the first thing she saw was Clara walking away from the house. Confused, she tapped on the window, asking her where she was going. In truth, however, Arabella knew the answer to that question. With a sinking heart, she realized that Lydia had no doubt dismissed the maid in order to put Clara's wages towards new clothes and other luxuries. Meanwhile, Henry was being very insistent about leaving Arabella's room. He was whining at the door and madly wagging his tail pausing to splash some water on her face and tidy her hair, Arabella opened it just as Imogen was exiting her own room, dressed for the day. Her stepsister halted on the threshold, staring at her appraisingly. Then she said, Oh, look, if it isn't Cinderella. Mother has sent Clara packing, so you have a few chores to take care of. Then, with a smirk, she added, you might want to change into something a little better suited for hard work. With that, she turned on her heel and flounced off down the carpeted hall her long curls bouncing defiantly as she descended the stairs. Arabella pondered what to do next. With Henry scurrying ahead of her, she went down the hall in the other direction and descended the back stairs to the kitchen. Cook was in there, beside herself. The kind lady couldn't afford to lose her position, but Lydia was demanding that she somehow do the cooking and all of Clara's tasks. Arabella embraced Cook, who she'd known most of her life, and reassured her that she would not leave her to manage alone. Resolutely taking Clara's apron from a hook on the back of the door, she tied it on and asked the older woman where she should start. 
and that was the day that Arabella, former favoured daughter and the only lady of the house, became a servant to her stepsisters and her stepmother. Cinderella, they would call out, light my fire, wash my clothes, iron my petticoat. At first, Agnes and Imogen did this with slight hesitation, as if they were aware of how wrong it was to treat her this way. After seeing that their mother was doing the same, however, their demands quickly increased. In fact, they did fewer things for themselves than they ever had before, as if to purposely overload poor Cinderella with an impossible amount of work. To humble her completely, they began referring to her only as Cinderella, as if her real name had been forgotten. In time, she heard their childish taunts in her own head, and she began to think of herself that way. After all, the new version of herself seemed to have little to do with the old one. And what else could Cinderella do? She'd promised her father that she would take care of the estate while he was away. Despite the length of his absence, which now stretched even beyond his last estimate, she felt sure that he would appear some day soon. How could she look him in the eye and say, I didn't want to be a maid. That's why the household is a shambles. No, it wouldn't do. She had been raised with the philosophy that living up to one's responsibilities was a point of personal honor. She would not disappoint him. Keeping this promise meant attending to the tiresome details of daily life. She mopped, she dusted, she polished the mirrors in which her stepsisters constantly reviewed their own reflections. The list of small responsibilities seemed to grow by the day, but there was nobody else to complete them. Furthermore, she was afraid of what Lydia would do if she had to get the money to hire another maid. The coin that her father had sent months ago was long gone. She'd noticed a few household objects vanishing. An antique clock, pieces of silver, a mirror with a heavy gold frame. If Lydia was selling her father's treasures, how long would it take her to get her mother's jewelry, for example, or to pawn her father's treasured books? Cinderella toiled, not to please Lydia and her stepsisters, but to hold together the home that she and her father had come to love. It was all she had left of her mother. All, that is, except the beautiful garden. As the summer months rolled into the autumn, and the hazy fall days chilled, and turned to winter, Cinderella sought refuge in the garden, 
in her few spare moments. Sitting on the bench near her mother's hazel tree, she watched the seasons go by, reveling in their quiet beauty. Her father had brought her mother the tree as a gift long ago. He'd told her that the Celts believed hazelnuts imparted wisdom and inspiration. This had delighted his bride, and she had always tended to the tree with great care. Her daughter now watched it for her, enjoying its yellow catkins in the spring and observing the creatures who came to take advantage of its nuts in the late summer. The scurrying squirrels and mice who pilfered its treasures made her smile. The months slipped by, turning to years, and Malcolm did not send word, nor did he return. Although Cinderella was resolved to keep her spirits up, she couldn't help but fear that he was lost to her forever, and that she was now trapped in a position of drudgery in her stepmother's household for drudgery was truly the way to describe her life. The cook continued to manage the meals, but it seemed that everything else fell to Cinderella. Lydia had continued to quietly sell items of value from various rooms of the house and Cook whispered that the woman was also known to be running up a debt in town. Fortunately, Lydia didn't know the whereabouts of the jewels Cinderella's mother had owned, because the girl had wisely hidden them long ago, carefully burying the box under her mother's hazel tree. Undeterred by the truth of their circumstances, Agnes and Imogen continued to buy whatever new clothes and jewels they could acquire. After dressing up, they would take the coach out and visit fashionable people around the area, hoping to be invited to social events for the two of them were both looking for husbands. Agnes was now nineteen, and Imogen was seventeen. It was not just rumours that kept them from attracting suitors. That was certainly a factor, but they were also lacking in wit. Neither of them provided entertainment, either by clever conversation or musical talents. Sadly, Cinderella's stepsisters were the very definition of mediocrity. In the absence of a fortune, they posed few attractions to the eligible bachelors of the region. Cinderella was seventeen as well, of course. In fact, she was just a few weeks younger than Imogen. But there was no question of her going out in society. Not only was Lydia far too keen on showcasing her own daughters first, 
but Cinderella had no decent clothes to wear anymore. She was clever with her needle, but she was not a magician, and she'd had nothing new since being relegated to the role of scullery maid two years before. Once in a while, Agnes would toss one of her old gowns at Cinderella and sneer, saying, Here, I don't want this anymore. In those cases, the girl would alter the dress to fit her, making it suitable for everyday wear. But in general, she'd made do with clothes that looked shabbier with each passing month. Compounding Cinderella's problems, it didn't escape Lydia's notice that despite her inferior clothing, her stepdaughter was luminous with youthful beauty. She had not had the advantage of dancing or deportment lessons that were considered essential for young ladies of society, and her lack of exposure to social events, even in the company of her family, left her without the affectations and coy flirtations of other eligible ladies her age. But while this may have seemed a disadvantage in society, it only enhanced her charm. As such, Lydia secretly fumed over the fact that no matter what she took from Cinderella, or what she subjected her to, she retained a natural grace and unaffected manner that made her even more beautiful. The wretched woman simply resolved to keep her out of view until her own daughters had found their matches. Finally, one autumn day, some news arrived that gave Lydia and her daughters great excitement. It seemed that the king and queen were to be spending the next few months at one of their country palaces, not far away. This was an unusual turn of events. Although the royal family had fine houses throughout the country, many of them were rarely visited. Apparently, they were going on progress through the kingdom because their oldest son was coming of age. Since he would one day be king, his parents had resolved to introduce him to his lands and the aristocrats who occupied them. Every mother of a debutante was filled with excitement, because it was well known that the handsome young prince was of an age to find a bride, and that his parents hoped he would marry a well-heeled young lady from within the kingdom. When the royal family arrived, they would surely throw a ball, and this meant that every dressmaker for miles around was about to become extremely busy making finery for the daughters of the region's most established families. There was, of course, one small wrinkle for Lydia there was simply no money left for clothes. 
within an hour of hearing of the prince's visit, she and her daughters were ransacking the house. Lydia had been searching periodically for the jewels that had once belonged to Malcolm's first wife. Her desire to dress her daughters in finery overcame her last shred of decency. She threw open her stepdaughter's bedroom door, demanding to know what she and Malcolm had done with the missing valuables. Cinderella was honest to a fault, and not one to lie. But this intrusion by her stepmother was too much for her. Lifting her chin with as much courage and defiance as she could muster, she quietly answered that she didn't know what Lydia was talking about. She said she hadn't seen her mother's jewels in many years, and suggested that perhaps Malcolm had put them somewhere for safekeeping, or sold them long ago. Knowing that the girl was probably not telling her the truth, Lydia ordered her to return to the kitchen and pointed to the hallway. Cinderella swept by and didn't look back as Lydia and her daughters began carelessly searching her room from top to bottom. As she descended the back stairs, Cinderella smiled to herself just a little. They would never find the precious jewels she had hidden safely in her mother's garden. Unable to uncover the missing rings and necklaces, Lydia confiscated the key to Cinderella's bedroom door. Then Lydia decimated Malcolm's precious library. A full stack of his most beloved and valuable books disappeared. In their place, a dressmaker arrived with bolts of beautiful fabric to measure Agnes and Imogen for their new evening wear. The parlour became buried in silks and crinolines, and excited conversation could be heard drifting down the hall as Lydia selected a colour and a style to dress up each of her daughters. As the cook commented, it was Lydia's intention to transform her two moths into butterflies. Her tone suggested that she did not expect it to work. Like making a silk purse out of a pig's ear, she muttered. As she watched her stepmothers and stepsisters, Cinderella couldn't help but wish that she too could attend a ball and meet a prince. And the season appeared to reflect her wistfulness. The crisp and lovely days of autumn blew away with a final windstorm, and the skies were sullen and grey. As everyone expected, an invitation to a late autumn ball at the palace soon arrived by messenger. Lydia opened the envelope and read the card aloud, with Agnes and Imogen gawking over her shoulder 
and bouncing with excitement. Cinderella heard it all from the hearth, where she was once again cleaning the fireplace. The king and queen hereby request the pleasure of your company at a royal ball, Lydia read. The rest of the details of the invitation were drowned out by silly giggling from her stepsisters. But Cinderella gathered that the occasion was happening soon, and that the ladies of the house would be attending without her. There was, however, little she could do about the situation. On the day of the ball, Lydia and her stepsisters were closeted in their chambers, taking hours to dress their hair and apply their makeup. Meanwhile, Cinderella was on her feet all day, pressing gowns, starching crinolines, and generally assisting with anything a lady's maid might have done. Her talent with needlework did her no favors. Any small repair or adjustment her sisters needed became her problem, and her natural sense of style, something Agnes and Imogen lacked, made her quite a help with details such as the curling and pinning of hair into just the right place. Lydia had managed to borrow a slightly nicer coach from an elderly neighbor who wasn't attending the event. The chattering ladies were packed into the carriage, even as Agnes and Imogen argued about whose dress was finer and whether or not Imogen was allowed to speak to the prince when Agnes was the eldest. The coachman kept a straight face as he waited for the hubbub in the carriage to settle. But he and Cinderella exchanged a momentary look as she stood on the stairs in their wake. She was nearly sure he winked at her kindly. The small gesture brought a smile to her face and made her feel less forlorn as the horses began trotting and pulled the carriage into the distance. Wrapping her threadbare shawl more tightly around herself, Cinderella listened to the clopping of the horses' hooves as they echoed away in the distance. Instead of going straight inside, she found herself oddly compelled to stand there on the steps for a few more moments. A cool wind blew lightly across her, gusting a few tumbling fallen leaves with it. Turning to watch them go, she followed their path as they soared up into the sky, circled briefly, and then floated down and stopped in her mother's garden. Yes, she thought, that's where I'll go and sit for a moment. Descending the wide front steps of the house, she followed a paved walkway through the overgrown hedges and opened the little gate 
that led to her special place. Although the little pond was freezing over and the branches of the hazel tree were bare, she gingerly sat on the edge of the cold stone bench. At that moment, her sweet little dog Henry came trotting into the garden. Cook had let him out of the kitchen to find her. Cinderella smiled wistfully at Henry and whispered loving words to him. He wagged his tail eagerly and then sat down by her feet, content to be with her despite the chill. As she stroked his fur, she realized that her eyes were watering. She missed her father so badly, and she was slowly losing hope that she'd see him again. Worse yet, her life here had become a trying one. What prospects did she have now? Who would care for her? With the cook and Henry as her only real friends, she didn't feel that her future was very bright. And in the short term, her young heart was broken over missing the ball. She smiled through her tears and said to Henry, I don't suppose you can conjure up a dress for me? Something pretty? and knew. Henry cocked his head to the side as if he understood her. And then something odd happened. Henry started whining and looking at something behind her, over her shoulder. And before she could react, his face was bathed in a warm glow, and his whining had turned to a happy bark. Twisting to see what had caught his attention, Cinderella laid eyes on the most amazing sight she had ever seen. Standing in front of the hazel tree, she saw the shimmering outline of a woman. The apparition was neither old nor young, but rather somewhere in the middle. The lady was wearing a somewhat old-fashioned dress that Cinderella recognized as a style of yesteryear. It was very elegant, though, and it floated around her in an ethereal mist. In fact, the lady herself almost seemed to levitate, as if she were not bound by the laws of gravity. A halo of light surrounded her suffusing her with a sparkling warmth that filled her speechless onlooker with a sense of well-being. Henry had stopped barking and sat expectantly, staring at the apparition. Meanwhile, Cinderella was tongue-tied what to say first to a gorgeous apparition such as this one, appearing spontaneously in the garden. Luckily, the presence spoke first. My child, she said with a concerned tone, 
You are troubled. You do not need to tell me why. I have seen everything. Freed of the obligation to come up with something to say, Cinderella looked on, waiting to see what the lady would do next. Your stepmother and stepsisters have been very unkind to you, and you have behaved admirably. You have borne a heavy weight in your young heart, she added. Although you didn't know it, I have always watched over you. My presence is here with the hazel tree, with this garden planted and carefully nurtured, and with the jewels your father gave your mother as a token of his love. At this, Cinderella's tears actually began to flow faster. The realization that someone knew of her humiliations and her trials, and that she was not entirely alone, was such a relief that she could not help herself. As she wept quietly, the apparition smiled sweetly at her. My dear, she said, dry your tears. I am here to bring you gifts. Stepping or floating aside, she motioned to the branches of the hazel tree. Cinderella could not believe her eyes. Hanging on its branches was the most beautiful dress she had ever seen. It was a gold color that glimmered subtly from top to bottom. The voluminous skirt floated gently on the wind flashing and sparkling in the darkening late afternoon. On the ground, she saw two dainty matching slippers, and hanging on a nearby branch was one of her mother's necklaces. It was a delicate thing made of diamond and topaz, this last detail confounded Cinderella, for she was sure that her mother's topaz necklace had been safely buried with all the others. Nonetheless, there was no time to check on the box now. Cinderella jumped to her feet, whispering her gratitude and almost afraid to touch the beautiful garment in front of her. Then her face fell. She turned to the lovely apparition and said, But how will I get there? I don't know the way, and our carriage is in disrepair for such a long journey. At this, the lady smiled and told her not to worry. She would manage everything. Then she gently waved her hand through the air, and like magic, Cinderella was wearing the dress and exquisite slippers. Best of all, she could feel the weight of the topaz necklace around her neck. She placed her hands gently upon the jewels, and then up higher to touch her hair, 
which had been magically arranged in a lovely mass of curls. Exuberantly, she spun in a circle, watching the dress rise around her, like a feather on the wind. She was glowing inside and out. The apparition smiled appreciatively at the results of her work and then flipped her hand in the direction of the vegetable garden, where two squirrels were examining an enormous pumpkin. Instantly, a fine coach was standing in the driveway with two tall, chestnut-colored horses. They whinnied lightly, as if surprised to find themselves there. Cinderella gasped with happy surprise at the sight. Then she heard a quick bark and turned to see that Henry was gone. In his place stood a diminutive coachman dressed in fine livery. He grinned at her as if they were old friends. Then he bowed ceremoniously and cheerfully indicated that she should step up to the carriage. Cinderella clapped her hands over her mouth in amusement and delight. Henry would be driving her to the royal ball. Spinning around to face her benefactress once again, she thanked the lady effusively, asking how she could ever repay her. The shimmering vision laughed sweetly and gestured magnanimously. Then she looked the happy girl in the eye and said, Darling, I am your godmother and it is my job to make you happy. This will be a beautiful night, but you must heed my words with care. At the stroke of midnight, all of this magic will vanish. The carriage will once again be a pumpkin. The horses will be squirrels again and scamper off. The coachman will regain his canine shape. And your beautiful dress will be replaced by the rags you wear to clean the fireplace. You must take care to be home before the stroke of midnight, or you will be in quite a bit of trouble. Do you understand? Cinderella nodded soberly. She would not forget her godmother's words. And so, her adventure began. Henry the coachman held out his hand gallantly and gestured to the step that would allow his lovely passenger to take her seat. The coach itself was very fine in appearance, far more impressive than anything her sisters could have borrowed from a neighbor. It was a rich brown color, and it stood up high on large spindly wheels. 
there were lamps mounted on either side, in both the front and the back, so that the night would not seem so dark. Slipping into the coach with wonder, Cinderella settled into its comfortable upholstered seats, and Henry handed her a soft blanket to keep her warm. Then he climbed up onto the driver's seat and clucked his tongue imperiously. The horses trotted gaily forward, giving Cinderella just a brief moment to wave gratefully to her godmother, who seemed to already be fading from the garden. Cinderella peered backwards for a moment, not wanting her to disappear. This was all such a whirlwind. She didn't want the magic to dissipate too. What had formerly seemed a blustery and unforgiving night became an evening of clear skies and chilly stars. Cinderella snuggled down under her blanket in the comfortable coach, feeling the soft bouncing of the conveyance as it sped across the miles to her destination. She had hardly left the house in years, let alone having gone anywhere in such style. Although her mind was on the magical night ahead, she also wanted to relish every single moment of this impossible trip. Almost too soon, the carriage was slowing down as it entered the long, circular drive of the country palace. Cinderella had heard of this place, but she had never actually laid eyes on it, and it was truly magnificent. The palace had been constructed more than a hundred years ago, and it boasted a huge main portico in the centre, creating the grandest approach possible. This part of the palace was flanked by a dramatic tower at either end. East and west wings stretched on either side of those towers in a horseshoe shape. These portions of the house were nearly identical, and Cinderella couldn't help trying to count how many bedrooms they must contain. There were pillars lining the entire front of the building, interspersed with rows of very tall windows that hinted of high-ceilinged reception rooms within. Atop the roofs of all these parts of the palace were statues, which felt like they were the dignitaries of the past, keeping watch over the arrivals. It was all Cinderella could do to muster her courage and lift up her chin when the footman opened the door to her carriage and invited her to step down. As she set first one and then the other delicate slipper down to the front steps, she looked back over her shoulder at Henry. He winked at her and signalled the horses that they were to move forward. 
she knew that he would be back for her in time to return to her home before the spell broke. He was such a faithful friend. Taking a deep breath, she looked up at the tall flight of stone stairs and began to climb. As she did, the beautiful strains of a waltz and the golden glow of what seemed to be a thousand low-lit lamps poured out the front doors. She became briefly concerned when she saw that guests were waiting at the door to be announced one by one. How would she explain her presence to her stepmother? In all the commotion, however, she was able to slip by the group of people at the entrance and melt into the crowd unnoticed. But this invisibility was short-lived, for Cinderella was truly unaware of what a stunning beauty she was. Even if she had not been wearing the most incredible gown in the room, her natural loveliness would have drawn every eye. As she drifted through the ballroom, taking in the lavish food, the opulent decorations, and the festive music. She left a trail of turning heads and whispers in her wake. It was the question on every other guest's tongue. Who was this astounding young lady? Nobody seemed to know. In fact, her transformation was so profound that Lydia and her daughters had no idea that their Cinderella was in their presence. Until the moment she arrived, they were focused entirely on the royal family, who were seated graciously on elaborate chairs in the front of the room. The king and queen were all smiles, and the prince was more handsome than any of them had dared to hope. The three women were in consultation about what they could do to gain an introduction or catch the prince's eye. Thus far, he had not left his seat. But when Cinderella floated through the ballroom, caught up in her own awe, the prince shifted forward a bit in his chair. His gaze into the crowd intensified. Then, he summoned a stately-looking servant who was posted near him and whispered in the man's ear. The man might have been seen to gaze across the room, easily identifying the subject of the prince's interest. As it turned out, the prince would not be seated much longer. Rather than summon the object of his admiration to stand in front of his chair, the prince rose and walked towards Cinderella. As he did, the assembled crowd parted smoothly before him, each guest dropping in a bow. When he reached the glittering girl, she summoned the most graceful curtsy she could manage 
and looked down at his shoes, whispering, Your Royal Highness. He reached out his hand and lifted her up, meeting her gaze with a warm smile. In response, he said, Would you honor me with a dance? It had been years since Cinderella's childhood dancing lessons, but that didn't seem to matter. The prince was a confident lead, and it seemed her feet simply knew where to go. As they swayed and spun and laughed, the other couples in the ballroom and the gawkers on the sidelines seemed to melt away. Breathless with delight, they never seemed to stop to talk, and the prince appeared to have no desire to choose a new partner. With the vibrant colors of the frescoes spinning above their heads, and the smooth marble of the floor gliding under their feet, the hours became minutes, and they had still not exchanged names. It seemed impossible to Cinderella when she heard the clock toll eleven. It was, she later reflected, the most doleful sound she had ever heard. Knowing she only had a few minutes to make her leave, she shyly told the prince that she would be right back, for what else could she say to him that would not end with having to reveal her name? He stepped back graciously, nodding his head. Then he said, I will be counting the moments. The crowd around them murmured as she moved towards the front hall. As soon as she had separated from him, they closed in, hoping to finally get a chance to introduce him to the other young ladies who had been watching him dance with this mysterious girl all evening. Seeing her opportunity, and knowing it was probably brief, Cinderella flew across the front hall in her slippers, lightly running down the front steps. As she had hoped, her carriage was waiting with Henry in the driver's seat. A footman opened the carriage door for her, and she slipped quietly into the safe darkness of the cushioned interior. In a moment, Henry had urged the horses forward and the coach rolled down the drive in a stately manner, as if nothing in the world were amiss. Cinderella leaned back in her seat, a tad breathless, and put her hand on her flushed cheek. She was filled with a rush of contradictory emotions. The thrill of the evening and of the prince's company competed with her nervousness at being discovered. She couldn't even imagine the wrath Lydia and her stepsisters would direct at her if they found out she had been the one 
to monopolize the prince all evening. And how could she possibly explain this dress, this incredible carriage, her dog turning into a coachman? As Henry whisked her away towards home, she laughed to herself, pulling the blanket up to her chin. This entire experience had been so unbelievable. She imagined regaling her father with the tale, and tears briefly welled up in her eyes. Oh, how she would have loved to share it with him. The carriage pulled into the driveway well before midnight. As she had expected, nobody else was home. Agnes and Imogen would be staying at the ball until the last possible moment, no doubt returning in a few hours. In the meantime, she knew the magic would only last a few more moments Wanting to hang on to it as long as possible, she left Henry in the coach and followed the path back to her mother's garden. The stars winked in the cold skies above, and a light breeze whistled through the courtyard. She sat gingerly on the edge of the stone bench, taking care not to damage the beautiful fabric of her gown. Lovingly touching her necklace, she closed her eyes and whispered a heartfelt thanks to this fairy who had appeared to help her. This godmother had changed her entire life in a single evening. At that moment, she felt through the necklace and the presence of that magic, like her mother was truly with her, and that perhaps she always had been. She was not alone. There was no clock to toll in the garden, but midnight broke the enchantment with a whisper. It was as if a gentle wind brushed across her. The leaves tumbled over the paving stones in a small gust. Then she was once again in her house dress, with Henry wagging his tail at her side. Turning to look at the place where the carriage had stood, she saw the pumpkin. With resignation, she walked over to it and returned the gourd to its slumber in the patch. She looked at Henry with a small smile, and he tilted his head and whimpered softly. It's time for bed, my friend, she said quietly. And then she made her way into the darkened house taking refuge in her bedroom. She lit a small fire for herself to ward off the freezing night air, and then she gratefully climbed into bed. She was so very tired all of a sudden. 
Cinderella closed her eyes, and all she saw were silk gowns spinning and twirling, and the handsome face of the prince, who would surely haunt her dreams. When she opened her eyes again, the sun was streaming through the drapes, and the house was quiet. Cinderella sat up and stretched luxuriously. The events of the night before came flooding back, prompting her to slide out of bed and peek out of the window. The borrowed carriage from the neighbor stood in the driveway, and there was no sign of her adventures. The garden looked the same as it always did. There was no gown, no fairy godmother, no pair of chestnut horses and Henry was standing inside her bedroom door, anxious for her to open it. Looking at the clock, she realized she had slept in. It was already eight, and she had fires to light and breakfast to serve. Luckily, The other exhausted ladies of the house were still abed and might sleep through the morning. She hoped so, as she was in no mood to hear their stories from the ball. Cinderella was in luck. Lydia, Agnes, and Imogen were snoring away in their rooms until the sun was high in the sky. The moody weather of the day before had been replaced by brilliant, crisp weather, and Cinderella felt happier than she'd been in years. She hummed to herself as she completed her usual chores unable to stop smiling about her secret. She might never again attend such a wonderful ball, but she felt as if the memory would stay with her forever. Most importantly though, she felt like there was a protective presence in the house with her now. It was as if there was nothing Lydia or her stepsisters could do or say to hurt her feelings anymore. When they finally did get themselves up, the other ladies were far more interested in gossiping about the ball than they were in taunting Cinderella. As she went about her daily tasks, she listened to them surreptitiously discussing the glamorous event and the mystery woman who had so enchanted the prince. To be certain, they were both quite put out that neither of them claimed a dance with him. Their mother chastised Agnes and Imogen, saying they must not have such ridiculous expectations. It was important that they were seen in the company of all the fashionable people present. It would certainly increase their chances of landing another eligible gentleman from the neighborhood. The girls both received this scolding with ill temper. 
as soon as their mother left the room, they returned to their scandalized whispering. The household returned to its daily routine, but the boredom was not to last for long. A few days later, another invitation arrived. It seemed that the royal family had decided to throw a second ball, and all the ladies of the house were once again invited. This threw Agnes and Imogen into a fair tizzy, and the dressmaker was summoned once again. Another section of Malcolm's library disappeared, and new gowns were ordered. After all, Lydia said over dinner, a young lady could not be seen twice in the same gown at consecutive royal balls. The dance was to be held in a week's time, and as the earliest days of winter settled upon the household, the mood was festive. On their social visits around town, Agnes and Imogen had heard the rumor that the prince was hoping to once again attract the dazzling young lady who had so intrigued him on the last occasion. Naturally, the two awkward sisters hoped that she wouldn't appear this time, so they could have another chance at meeting the prince. However, there were always other gentlemen who would be present, and, as their mother pointed out, that was of great value to them. Secretly, Cinderella was torn, and she became a bit clumsy with her chores for her daydreaming. On one hand, she couldn't help hoping that her magical fairy godmother would turn up again and produce the beautiful dress and the coach for a second time. However, the practical side of the girl wanted to guard her heart from disappointment. She resolved to assume that she would not be granted that gift a second time. Once was good enough, she told herself. Once was enough. But she dreamed of dancing at night. The day of the second ball finally arrived. Lydia had trespassed upon the kindness of yet another neighbor and borrowed a passable carriage. Meanwhile, Agnes and Imogen were more demanding than ever. Cinderella was required to starch their crinolines until they practically stood up on their own. She was ordered to curl and arrange hair to help with buttoning gowns. She had hardly a moment to dwell on what the night may or may not have held that would contribute to her own happiness. This time, as she watched the carriage with the other ladies pull away, she knew that she'd be heading straight for her bench in the garden. Henry trotted at her heels, and her shawl was pulled tightly around herself again. 
for the scent of the first snow was on the wind, and the cold was biting. Pushing open the gate, she felt some disappointment not to see her golden dress hanging on the tree once more. She chastised herself and perched on the stone bench, ruefully scratching Henry behind the ears. It had been too much to hope that her fairy godmother would make the magic happen a second time. Looking up at the sky, she tried to think positive thoughts. She closed her eyes and relived those breathless moments of gliding across the dance floor on that last perfect night. She felt the starry candlelight all around her. She felt the heat of the crowded room. She sensed the smoothness of the marble under her feet. And when she opened her eyes again, her astonishment knew no bounds. To her left, a shining silver gown glittered in the tree. Beneath it, a pair of lovely matching slippers balanced on the ground, and on an outer branch next to the dress hung a delicate silver and sapphire necklace. She was nearly certain once again that it was a treasure that had mysteriously come from her mother's box. She was sure she had seen it before. Turning her head, she saw with joy that her shimmering fairy godmother stood nearby. She smiled at Cinderella, managing to be at the same time hardly visible and completely present. Her love and goodwill flooded the garden with a rosy glow that lifted the girl's spirits. With a small gasp, Cinderella realized she was about to have another adventure. Without a word, the apparition motioned again towards the pumpkin in the garden. Then she waved her other hand at two birds sitting in the hazel tree. Instantly, a coach stood in the driveway. It was even more magnificent than the rich brown one of the last ball. This carriage was black, lavishly trimmed with silver. In front of it, a team of powerful ebony horses stood, each wearing a feather atop its headdress. Once again, Grinning as if sharing her delight, Henry stood dressed in a livery that matched the coach, waiting for his mistress to be ready. Bursting with happiness, Cinderella spun in a circle, knowing that the dress would be on her in a moment. As she completed her revolution, its gauzy silver layers floated down gently around her, as if enveloping her in a dream. 
she put one white gloved hand up to her neck and felt the weight of her mother's sapphire resting there, and her fingers touched the curls that cascaded elegantly about her head. She was ready. But her godmother had a warning to repeat. Dear girl, do not forget that this magic will expire at midnight. Do not lose your head and stay too long, or you will once again be revealed in your rags. Your coach will be a pumpkin, fit only for the patch. Your horses and your coachman will be birds and a dog. Keep your wits about you, and all will be well. Cinderella clasped her hands and nodded firmly. She promised her fairy godmother that she would not forget. Then she made haste, for she was thrilled with the promise of the evening to come and she didn't want to lose a minute. And off the coach went, with the horses clip-clopping merrily down the road, pulling their darling Cinderella towards the royal ball once again. The night was overcast with the promise of snow, and the moon peeked out from the clouds only from time to time. As the carriage sped towards the palace, white snowflakes began flying by the windows, visible in the light of the lamps at either end. It was a gentle snow, appearing with the lightest touch, as if to shyly introduce the winter once again. When the coach pulled up to the palace, the blazing lamps inside seemed even more festive than they had the last time. In contrast to the first bite of winter on the front steps, the entrance hall was a beacon of light. The darkness instantly melted away as guests crossed the threshold and were announced. Once again, Cinderella slipped by briefly unnoticed. However, this was just barely, for her appearance in the entryway to the ballroom created an immediate stir. Decorum fell by the wayside when the ripple of excitement in the crowd reached the front of the room. This was where the royal family once again sat, presiding over the event. Forgetting his royal position, the prince involuntarily stood from his seat, his eyes burning a path across the crowd to the place where Cinderella stood, a silvery vision. For, of course, she had no idea that she was the most beautiful woman in the room. She was, in fact, the most lovely girl anyone there could remember seeing. Not only was her gown 
even more magnificent than the one she had worn before. But there was something new and luminous in her. She radiated hope, self-confidence. She was suffused with a certain something nobody could put their finger on. It could only be described as magic. A thousand whispers could be heard as the prince walked straight towards Cinderella, who stood fixed in place like a statue. Upon reaching her, he smiled from ear to ear and bowed down, saying, May I have this dance? She couldn't hide her expression of delight as she accepted his hand, and he whirled her onto the dance floor as if they were simply picking up where they had left off. Resuming their dance, from the night when she vanished after the stroke of eleven. Cinderella felt as though her feet were not even touching the ground. In that moment, she hadn't a care in the world. Swept away by the music and the thrill of it all, she was brought back to reality only when the prince spoke to her. We haven't actually been introduced, he said, with a lopsided smile. It's ridiculous, but I haven't even mentioned that my name is Edward. Cinderella had in fact known that his name was Edward. Everybody knew. What her mind was slowly registering, however, was that he was politely attempting to find out what her name was in exchange. Of course, she had mentally prepared for this unavoidable moment. If the gossip was true, he'd been eager to locate her a second time. In coming here, she'd resolved to somehow enjoy his company again, without revealing her identity. Because truly, beyond the wrath she would experience from Lydia, what would he think of her if he found out who she really was? How could he possibly continue to see her, knowing of her humble position in a household that was fast descending into debt? A fatherless girl with no fortune? No. She had vowed he would not discover her identity, and she would somehow avoid lying to him in the process. Smiling shyly, she looked down at her shimmering skirts, which floated around the pair as they danced in perfect time. Then, Summoning a little bit of courage, she said, I will tell you my name if you can guess what I call my little dog. At this, the prince laughed aloud. It was rare that any young lady had the courage to play such a game with him. Stepping with renewed vigor, he started trying out names. Spot, Buster, Captain, 
he offered. She shook her head with a sly smile. Well, is it a girl or boy? he asked. You must narrow it down for me. Cinderella cocked her head to the side as they swayed back and forth. She felt that it wouldn't hurt her subterfuge to offer him this concession. He is a boy, she said primly. At this, Edward gained a comical look of concentration. Miles? Jasper? He continued. Narrowing his eyes, he added, I feel quite sure you are the type to have a dog named Jasper. Smiling indulgently, Cinderella shook her head. You are wrong, she countered. I had an uncle named Jasper, and I found him quite dull. At this, the prince grinned once again and swung her faster in a circle. In that moment, she felt she had never been happier in her life. The riddle of her dog's name derailed Edward from pressing her for her identity. But she had another problem. Somehow, she had to create the notion that she might take a break on the veranda and still return to dance with him again. After she'd given him the slip at the last ball, he was anxious not to lose track of her a second time. How could she slip out later? More than once, she begged a few moments to rest, making sure she didn't leave the room. During those times, while she sipped some punch or rested her feet, he was obligated to speak with other guests who clamored for his attention. When the clock struck eleven, her heart sank. Just one more dance. Just two more dances, she told herself. There will be plenty of time. By 11.30, she knew she hadn't another moment to spare. She told Edward she would be taking a breath of air in the hallway. He regretfully turned to talk with other guests, while she made her way into the tall-ceilinged foyer. Then, as quietly as a mouse, she slipped out the front door, unnoticed. She made haste to her waiting carriage, where Henry tapped his foot impatiently. On her journey homeward, she saw that the world had become frosted with white, with snowflakes flying wildly around them, Henry urged the horses to travel faster. As they moved quickly through the snowy countryside, he didn't need to say a word to his mistress. Cinderella knew that she had almost made a critical error by staying so late. She chided herself for her foolishness and hoped they would make it back before the stroke of midnight. 
the coach pulled up to a darkened house once again, and Cinderella had barely stepped to the ground when her entire carriage vanished. Suddenly in her rags again, she turned to see Henry sitting next to the pumpkin. He barked at her as the two birds, once her beautiful ebony horses, flew off into the night. She stood still for a moment, catching her breath in the courtyard. It felt to her like everything was beginning to move too quickly. What had first been a fantasy for a single evening had turned into so much more. She realized with a sinking feeling that she had given herself over to the magic too much. She had allowed herself to hope for something better, for love, for another life. And now, she couldn't take her heart back. She had already given it to Edward. Dragging the enormous pumpkin back to its place in the garden, she slowly made her way up to her room. Once there, she shut herself securely inside, lighting a warm fire in the hearth to comfort her. Donning her nightdress, she slowly climbed into bed. It was too dark to see the snow falling outside, but she fell asleep to the tip-tapping of the little ice crystals as they hit the window in the darkness. She slept deeply and dreamed of dancing. The morning dawned with heavy, leaden skies. The world outside was coated in white, but to Cinderella, the monochrome landscape felt bleak rather than pretty. Her mood certainly matched the scenery. How could she face her real life after her enchanting second night with Edward? After the first ball, the prince had been more of an idea than an actual bow. But now, he was first and foremost a handsome suitor who had a maddeningly attractive sense of humor as well. The thought that she would never see him again was almost more than she could bear. Agnes and Imogen were likewise in a dark mood. Not only had the mysterious woman once again monopolized the prince all night, but they had also failed to land any decent potential suitors. Making matters worse, the royal family was scheduled to leave soon, making progress to another county where they would spend the rest of the winter. The two pouting misses took out their lack of sleep and their frustrations on Cinderella, petulantly demanding she complete all types of unusual tasks. 
and scolding her when they were not done to their satisfaction. Of course, satisfying them would have been impossible. They were unfailingly contrary, and nothing would make them happy on that day. In the afternoon, while Lydia and her stepsisters were napping, Cinderella pulled on a heavy shawl and went outside, standing in the middle of her garden. The fountain was silent and frozen, and the branches of the hazel tree were coated in ice. Closing her eyes, she wished fervently that her fairy godmother would appear and offer some kind of comfort to her. But try as she might, she was not able to conjure the kindly apparition. For the first time in her young life, Cinderella felt alone in the little courtyard that had once been her sanctuary. As a gust of wind whirled up the snow from the ground, she wiped away a tear. What good had the magic been if it had all come to nothing? Retreating to the house, she took advantage of the peace and quiet, falling into a heavy sleep on her bed. She awoke to a brighter day, feeling foggy. Lying there, staring up at the ceiling, Cinderella realized that it was her birthday. She was turning 18, and she was quite sure that nobody would even remember. She rolled over and looked at Henry happily wagging his tail by the door. It's my birthday, Henry, she said. The dog whined quietly and stepped from foot to foot. Cinderella smiled at him indulgently. You'll have to be my present today, she said as she rose and straightened herself up. While standing at her mirror, she noticed there was a bit of a commotion in the hallway. Imogen was calling down the corridor to Agnes, and they were discussing something in high-pitched voices. Cautiously opening her door, Cinderella stuck her head out to see what was going on. Her stepsisters were standing with Lydia between them, huddled over a piece of paper. Sensing her presence, all three of them stopped talking and glared at her directly. Then Lydia said, Cinderella, it's about time you made an appearance, you lazy girl. Be hasty with your morning chores, for your skills will be needed in the drawing room. There is to be a third ball in just three days, and there won't be time to order new gowns. You'll have to dress up the ones Agnes and Imogen 
already have. With that, the three women turned away and went rushing down the hall to chatter about plans and to pen a note begging another neighbor for the loan of their carriage. Cinderella stood frozen in the long hallway, filled with conflicting emotions. On one hand, another chance to see Prince Edward was the best birthday gift she could have asked for, one worthy of her fairy godmother. However, she also knew that she was perilously close to falling head over heels in love with a man who could never know her name. A man who surely wouldn't want to marry her if he knew the truth. Gazing down at her house dress and suddenly conscious of her messy hair, she imagined him arriving at their front door to meet her family. Then the image dissolved in her mind because it was too improbable to conjure any further. Shaking her head, she pushed the ridiculous notion to the back of her thoughts and went downstairs to begin her labors in the kitchen. This was going to be a trying day, she thought. And of course, she was not wrong. As skillful as she was with a needle, she was not a magician. It would have taken the arts of her fairy godmother to create the impression that Agnes and Imogen had new dresses. She spent the afternoon with Lydia barking orders as she tied one piece of lace after another and pinned this or that ribbon differently. In the end, she was tasked with a series of alterations that would keep her quite busy until the ball. On the day of the ball, the entire household awoke to a heavy snowfall. And oh, how it was coming down. Worried that the roads would become impassable, Lydia bustled her daughters and their finery into the borrowed carriage once again and set off for the home of an acquaintance in town. From there, it would be a much easier journey to reach the palace that night. Accordingly, Cinderella convinced Cook to leave early so she might get home safely to her family. This left the girl alone with just Henry for company. It was a relief to have her stepsisters out of the house, but the grey hours of the afternoon seemed to last forever. She felt quite alone on the estate as the skies only grew darker. While she waited, curled up in the cocoon of her window seat, she got her thoughts in order. Yes, she decided she would go to the ball, providing her fairy godmother appeared for her one final time. 
And yes, she continued, she would dance with Edward again. Blushing to herself, she was filled with joy to know in her heart that he would ask for her company again. And when the night was over, his family would leave the county. There would be no more reason for her to moon about. She would go on with her life and be grateful that she had met him, and that she had been this happy for a little while. The only remaining problem was how to somehow conceal her identity a third time. Deep in her heart, Cinderella knew she was fooling herself with all this well-intentioned resolve to move on. She knew that to see the prince again was to risk her heart, but she could not stay away. Pushing down any thoughts of the like, she stepped outside at dusk. The world was hushed, weighted with the silence that only a heavy snowfall can bring. The flakes came down thickly all around her, coating her hair and her shoulders within moments. She watched the ground, mesmerized, as she made fresh tracks in the purest white snow. Behind her, Henry silently created a miniature trail of paw prints to parallel her own path. She opened the gate with some difficulty, breaking through the small drifts that had accumulated around it. Then, feeling confident in the existence of the magic, she stood still and made no sound. She didn't even take a breath. She simply waited, closing her eyes and earnestly wishing for the enchantment to last one more night. It wasn't a sound or a light that made her open her eyes. Rather, she felt as if a million tiny crystals washed over her, and she knew that it was happening again. Opening her eyes, she gasped, for the gown that hung before her in the hazel tree was unlike any she had ever seen. If a person could collect the stars in the sky and weave them into a divine fabric, that's what her fairy godmother had done to conjure this dress. It wasn't silver. It was as if it was made of diamonds and light. The skirts were like gauze, floating and shimmering with every small movement of the breeze. Two impossibly dainty brilliant slippers stood on the ground beneath. They looked as if they were made of glass, an effect no mortal shoemaker could have created. And on the branch next to the gown, 
instead of a necklace. A modest little diamond tiara glittered. Like the topaz and sapphire jewelry, Cinderella recognized it as a piece her mother had once worn on very special occasions. Her mother would be with her tonight. Overcome with gratitude, Cinderella turned to the ethereal benefactress once again. But her smile soon fell. How would she get to the ball? The weather had made the road nearly impassable. Is it too late? she asked the beautiful apparition. At this, her godmother gave a laugh so musical it almost sounded like chimes, and she shook her head. Waving her hand in the general direction of the pumpkin, for it was now buried under the snow, she made a flourish. In seconds, a handsome sleigh had appeared in the drive. Then, as a furry white rabbit hopped across the garden, her godmother waved the other hand. Instantly, it had disappeared, and a beautiful white horse stood hitched to the sleigh instead. And, of course, Henry followed moments after in his transformation. This time, he'd be driving her to the ball in high style, on metal runners that flew across the ice and snow. Hardly able to contain herself, Cinderella turned in a circle, knowing that she would soon be dressed in the delicate, starry gown. And she was. But even as she sensed the skirts settling around her, she was also aware of a luxurious velvet cloak that covered her. It protected her perfectly styled curls with a capacious hood and sheltered her from the ice and snow. The little tiara sparkled elegantly in her hair. Henry helped her into the cushioned back seat of the silver and red sleigh and then took up his position in the front. Cinderella turned to her godmother with happy gratitude. She was not surprised to receive the familiar reminder about being home by midnight. This will be a beautiful evening, her godmother said. But then, more sternly, she urged, Do not test the limits of the magic. The midnight hour is still the moment of its expiration. If you stay too long, you'll find yourself in a mess. Be sensible, and all will be well. Eager to be off, Cinderella issued a solemn promise to be responsible. Their swift progress towards the third and final royal ball was dreamlike. 
The weather was unrelenting, dropping a heavy curtain of white all around the speeding sleigh. However, in contrast to the rumbling and bouncing of the carriage, the sleigh made Cinderella feel like she was flying. Wrapped inside her protective coat, safe from the elements, she watched the ghostly landscape glide by. It was otherworldly. Despite how quick the journey was, her arrival could not come soon enough. She was acutely aware that this would be the last time that these would be her last dances and smiles with Edward. She was simultaneously eager to begin the evening and loathsome for the inevitable end of it to approach. When her sleigh pulled up to the front steps, the footman at the door seemed impressed, pulling themselves up a little taller. The man who helped her step down forgot his usual deferential pose and looked up at her with open admiration. Even hidden under her cloak as she was, her arrival made a stir. As she gingerly made her way up the steps to the front door, another servant bowed low, motioning her inside. This time, coats and capes were being taken from the guests and whisked away to a nearby room. The visitors were then introduced once the ladies had been given an opportunity to rearrange their garments and their hair. Cinderella took careful note of the location of the cloakroom. Then she stepped into the shadows near the ballroom entrance and swept in behind another family who had just been announced. Breathing a sigh of relief, she stood on the side and looked around to get her bearings. But it was impossible for her to remain unnoticed. An audible gasp seemed to travel around the room as the other guests took in her astounding beauty. Amid all the other fine silks, heavy velvets, and demure ribbons and laces, her gown was truly a sight to behold, and she glowed from within. Cinderella turned uncertainly and nodded politely to the people staring at her on either side. Thankfully, she was rescued by Edward, who appeared starstruck in front of her. Bowing low, he invited her to dance. If previous waltzes had been invigorating, or delightful, or enchanting, this one was like a spell. At first, they swayed through the steps with their eyes locked. Not a word passed between them. 
It was like a magnet drew them together. Their embrace was decorous, but also inseparable. When the music changed, there was no question of changing partners. The prince would have no other. With curiosity, he asked her why she kept leaving unexpectedly without offering an explanation. Cinderella had anticipated this question, and she knew that evasiveness was her only option. Falling back on the privilege of a lady to her privacy, she apologized for the inconvenience and said that she had been called away at the last moment. Edward knew he must be satisfied with this answer, and they returned to dancing in silence. But not before he impulsively said, I do believe you are the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Cinderella blushed deeply at this, unable to hide her pleasure at his words. Looking back steadfastly at his kind eyes and his handsome smile, she responded that he looked very fine himself, and the two danced on oblivious to the rest of the company. After a time, Edward asked her when she was going to tell him her name. She responded that, since he was not good at guessing, she would tell him what she called her little dog, and that he would get her name if he asked her after midnight. Playing along with her game, he said, Well then, let's have it. What is your dog's name? It's Henry, she said decisively. Well, he responded with a skeptical look, I must say, I think Jasper would be better. Then both of them laughed, and he whirled her faster around the room. Soon he spoke again. You have to tell me something about yourself. Do you play the piano? At this, Cinderella shook her head. I'm afraid any man who wishes to hear the piano in my company must play it himself, she responded with gravity. This did not seem to bother the prince at all. He asked her another question. Is there any type of book you like to read? At this, Cinderella brightened. Yes, I love to read. My father has, or had, quite a collection of books. I like to read histories, poetry, well, everything really. The prince smiled broadly at this. He responded, I do love histories. I'm intrigued by stories of the world. I wish I could go adventuring, but he cocked his head at his mother and father, seated in their grand chairs. 
I am not really afforded the freedom to do that right now. Cinderella nodded sympathetically, and they continued their turn around the room. Then, wistfully, Edward asked her to tell him just one more thing about herself. Anything. Pondering the question for a moment, she responded, Last week, it was my 18th birthday. Brightening, Edward wished her a very happy birthday. At this, she felt butterflies in her stomach, and she looked down as if concentrating on her footwork. They both wished the night would never end. But end it must, and the time came when Cinderella knew she would have to break her own heart by carrying out a secret departure. She told Edward she was taking some air in the foyer, for the outdoor balcony was quite buried in snow. Her plan had been to slip into the cloakroom, but an unexpected obstacle appeared in the form of Agnes, who seemed to be pursuing the company of a young gentleman. The awkward pair was standing right in front of the door. As the minutes ticked by, Cinderella lingered in the foyer, waiting. She waved to Edward, who stood across the ballroom, occasionally glancing in her direction. Then she made a motion to fan her face, as if she were still too warm. The minutes dragged on. Finally, at least five minutes after the clock had told 11.30, Agnes released her hold on the hapless gentleman, returning to the ballroom. He hastily walked away, and Cinderella saw her chance. Slipping through the door, She located her cloak and pulled it around her, covering her head. Then she glided calmly through the foyer, making straight for the front door. Henry was waiting at the foot of the stairs with the sleigh, and she quickened her step. But right in the middle of the stairs, she slightly lost her footing, and one of her delicate slippers fell off her foot, becoming lodged in the deepening snow. As the footmen cried after her that they would assist, she knew she did not have time to stop nor could she afford to be noticed further. Leaving the precious slipper behind, she made haste to the sleigh and climbed into the back seat, her cloak and her skirts ballooning behind her. Quick as a rabbit, the white horse took off, pulling the sleigh smoothly in its wake. As the sleigh darted away from the palace, 
Cinderella chanced a final glance into the darkness behind her. The footman stood on the steps, holding her shoe, clearly in a commotion. For a third time, she had escaped the ball without offering an explanation. This time, however, just barely. During the speedy trip home, the snow finally stopped falling, and the moon emerged from the clouds. The eerily beautiful landscape seemed to lie purposely still, willing the sled to travel faster. Onward, onward, the hills and the snow-covered trees seemed to whisper, do not delay. In the end, Cinderella and Henry almost made it to the front door, but not quite. At the gates of the estate, the sleigh vanished, and Cinderella felt herself tumble into a snowdrift. Pulling herself up in a daze, she lifted her eyes just in time to see a white rabbit darting across the moonlit lawn. Henry sat nearby, shaking ice off his coat. Cinderella sat in the wet snow, oblivious to the cold. She looked at the fat pumpkin and then pulled herself to her feet. She left the heavy gourd there by the gate. It wasn't until she had trudged up the drive and climbed the front stairs that she realized something odd. Her cloak had vanished. Her clothes were once again rags. The tiara was gone. But one slipper still clung to her left foot. In amazement, she reached down and removed it, balancing the sparkling item in her palm. She didn't understand how it was still with her, but she would treasure it and hide it well so that nobody could take it away. Pushing her way into the dark house, she went straight to her room and pulled the covers of her bed over her head. In moments, she had succumbed to a dark and dreamless sleep. She awoke in the mid-morning the next day to a brilliant winter wonderland outside her window. The storm had passed and the sun reflected off every surface, filling even the gloomiest corners of the old house with natural light from outside. Cinderella dragged herself from her bed and went to her window seat. Peeking down at the front steps, she could see that Lydia and her stepsisters had somehow made it home in the wee hours of the morning. She was sure it must have been an arduous journey, 
a suspicion that was further supported by the silence in the hallway. They were all still abed, and probably would be for hours. Turning around in her nook, Cinderella's eyes fell upon the dainty shoe that sat on her dressing table. What a wonder it was that the slipper was still here, she thought to herself. What lapse had occurred in the magic that it had been left behind? Perhaps it had something to do with the fact that she had lost the other one at the palace. She could make no sense of it, but she was happy to have it as a memento of what she was sure she'd remember as one of the best nights of her life. Wistfully, she tucked the shoe far underneath the dressing table. She smiled at Henry, who wagged his tail sympathetically at the door. She would have plenty of days to fill with memories of Edward in the future. But right now, she knew that the cook would be downstairs in need of her assistance. As before, her stepsisters rose and dressed in mid-afternoon. They then lounged about in the parlor, idly gossiping about the events of the ball. As before, they expressed annoyance with the mysterious lady who had once again danced all night with Prince Edward. To think, Agnes complained, that we were there three times and never even got to meet him. Imogen agreed that it was ridiculous and sniffed that it was just as well he was leaving the county as his dances were becoming quite tiresome. Cinderella shook her head to herself as she dusted the portraits in the corridor outside. She knew that her stepsisters were going to have to return to a reliance on country visits to other households in order to meet any young gentleman now. Lydia was sure to be in a terrible mood. The warmth of the sun began to melt the snowdrifts that day, and by the time the household awakened the next morning, it seemed like the world was coated in glass. Icicles hung from tree branches and from the eaves of the house. The snow was not as deep as it had been the day before, and the roads had become much more passable for horses and carriages. Nonetheless, accustomed as they were to isolation, the ladies were quite surprised to see a very richly appointed coach approaching the house in the late afternoon. Their curiosity turned to outright amazement when Prince Edward stepped out of the conveyance. He approached the house followed by a haughty-looking footman, who appeared to be carrying a sparkling slipper. 
without understanding how Prince Edward's arrival was even possible, or speculating that a mistake might have been made. Agnes and Imogen plunged towards the mirror, tidying their hair and pinching their cheeks. There was no time to change their clothes. He was climbing the steps at that very moment. They hastily positioned themselves at the top of the stairs. But on the way there, Imogen had the idea to make sure Cinderella was hidden away. Knowing that the key to Cinderella's own room had been confiscated by Lydia, Agnes pushed the girl into Imogen's chamber and pulled the door shut, locking it from the outside. Cinderella thumped at the door. She didn't fully understand why she had been locked in, but she knew it had something to do with a surprise visitor. To be trapped in Imogen's messy chamber was an insult greater than she could quietly bear. Meanwhile, Lydia dragged the cook upstairs and bade her open the door, because she was the only person available in the house who appeared to be a servant. Once that charade was complete, the prince's footman announced that they had come to visit the young lady in the house, who was eighteen years of age. They were, in fact, visiting every house in the county where an eighteen-year-old debutante lived. They were in search of the young lady who happened to be the owner of this unusual shoe. Saying this, the footman held up the slipper with a flourish. Standing behind Lydia on the stairs, Imogen's eyes widened. She knew it was not her shoe, but as she was the only visible eighteen-year-old lady in the house, she was determined to seize the opportunity. As Lydia swept aside, inviting the royal visitors in, Imogen sashayed front and centre and dropped a comically low curtsy. Meanwhile, Agnes pouted on the stairs. It was outrageous that Imogen should be the one to get a chance at the prince. The footman looked sideways at Edward, with an expression of scepticism. Likewise, Edward seemed crestfallen. This could not possibly be the ethereal creature he'd fallen in love with over the past few weeks. Sensing his hesitation, Imogen took action. Your Royal Highness, she began, her voice dripping with sweetness. I am so grateful to you for bringing my slipper back. Regretfully, the other was lost in the storm on the way home last night. However, I'm quite sure this one is mine. The prince peered at her again, cocking an eyebrow. Lydia's smile was frozen on her face. 
Seeing that Edward was about to withdraw, she pressed him further. Imogen is right about the sad loss of her other slipper. However, might she not try it on for you? I'm quite sure it will fit like a glove. At this, Agnes snorted from the stairway, earning herself a pointed look from her younger sister. Imogen's feet and hands were on the large side, and this slipper appeared to be quite petite. All three women were aware that getting Imogen's foot into it would be quite a task. Before the prince could object, Lydia motioned impatiently to Cook that she should bring a chair. Rolling her eyes, the weary woman fetched one from another room, placing it squarely in the middle of the foyer. Imogen seated herself with great airs, behaving as she supposed a great lady might. Then, summoning a bit of a blush, she lifted up her foot and presented it to the royal servant. Giving the prince another wry glance, the man politely knelt down and attempted to slip the shoe onto Imogen's foot. He wriggled it, he knocked it, he adjusted its position. Imogen attempted to assist him, twisting her ankle this way and that, and furrowing her brow in concentration. Finally, by some miracle, she managed to jam her foot precariously inside. Although the shoe was bent and clearly did not suit her at all. Nonetheless, she saw a chance for victory. See, she said brightly, it's as if it was made for me. Then, covering her mouth in a full show of modesty, she added, And of course, it was. It's my slipper. Mine. You can tell. Edward stood there, wordless. He looked like he might feel a bit unwell. But just then, there was an interruption that saved him from further unpleasantness. A little dog came running down the stairs, whining. Dodging Agnes and her skirts, he leapt into the foyer, darted around Lydia, and sat in front of the prince with a shoe in his teeth. Edward's eyes widened with surprise, for it was the exact match that he was seeking. And he was not the only one who appeared shocked. One by one, each woman in the hall widened her stare and brought a hand to her mouth. Replaying the ball in their minds, Lydia, Agnes, and Imogen realized the truth at the same moment. The mysterious girl had been none other than Cinderella. 
This all happened in a matter of seconds, and Imogen made a move to grab the slipper from the dog's mouth. My shoe, she said, as if delighted. But the faithful pup would not relinquish his treasure. He held fast to it, digging his little feet into the rug and pulling backwards. A comical tug of war ensued, and Agnes dissolved into a very inappropriate fit of laughter. Then, Failing to grab the shoe after several moments, Imogen said, Henry, let the slipper go. And then it was in her hands, but it was too late. Edward had heard the name that his beloved called her little dog. Looking at Lydia with a piercing stare, he asked where the other eighteen-year-old lady of the house was. One would think at this stage of the ruse that the stepmother would have acknowledged Cinderella's presence and tried to play the entire thing off as a misunderstanding. But Lydia was not ready to give up. She folded her arms and said there was no other lady in the house, just a serving girl. So Edward said, Please summon the serving girl. Spluttering with indignation, Lydia tried to make another excuse, but it was too late. Agnes had gone upstairs and unlocked the door to Imogen's room, and Cinderella had appeared on the stairs above, dressed in her rags. Now, one could say that Agnes did this to spite Imogen. Or, if a person had a sunny of you, they could say that she finally repented for treating Cinderella so poorly. Then again, isn't it wise to ally oneself with a person who is about to become a princess. Whatever reason Agnes had for helping Cinderella out of the locked chamber, the important point is, it happened. And in doing so, Agnes was the final, improbable bit of magic that made Cinderella's dreams come true. The moment that Edward spied Cinderella, a silent transformation overcame the players assembled in the foyer. The prince's face was beaming. Cinderella stood defiantly finally ready to reveal herself. Lydia seemed to be composing herself in preparation to fawn all over her stepdaughter, offering explanations. Imogen looked angry, whereas Agnes, standing on the landing with a key in her hand, appeared at peace. And the footman and cook, they had the appearance of two people who had seen justice done. 
they were obviously delighted. Henry broke the spell, bouncing up the stairs to greet his mistress. And at that moment, everyone was moving. The prince walked towards Cinderella as she descended the stairs, and all the ladies were a flutter. Then Edward and Cinderella stood like an island in the midst of the confusion, their eyes locked together. Neither of them wanted to be parted again. Cook made them comfortable in the parlor, and Lydia thought it best for the rest of them to withdraw, hoping the prince would overlook their terrible behavior. When Cinderella shared the plain circumstances of her poverty with Edward, he was surprisingly unconcerned. My parents certainly want me to choose a wife who will be a suitable partner in my public life, he said. But your circumstances are not your fault and we do not need money from your family. If you can tolerate my terrible taste in dog names, I would very much love it if you'd agree to be my wife. And, of course, she said yes, because she loved him. Having gained her acceptance, he furrowed his brow and appeared concerned. Afraid that something had occurred to him to prevent their marriage, Cinderella asked him what was wrong. Well, he said, you still have not told me your name. How incredible that I proposed to you without even knowing it. Ah, she said, smiling. My stepsisters and my stepmother call me Cinderella, but I would much prefer that you call me by the name my mother and father gave me, which is... Arabella. Edward smiled, for he finally knew the name of the woman who had captured his heart. And so it was that later that week, Arabella gathered Henry and her few possessions and was whisked away to the palace where an army of servants helped her prepare for her nuptials. After all, there was so very much to do, and it was far too much to put on Cook. Before she departed, Arabella returned one last time to her mother's garden where she knelt down and uncovered her mother's box of jewels. Opening it carefully, she saw that they were all still there, as if they'd never been disturbed. The topaz, the sapphire, and the tiara lay nestled safely next to her mother's wedding ring. This last item she held up to the light, turning it every which way. She decided 
she would wear it when she was married. A few weeks after she moved into the palace, Edward appeared in the elegant drawing room while she was discussing some aspect of her wedding dress with the seamstresses. He appeared very excited and told her that he had a surprise for her. Stepping aside, he revealed Malcolm. Neither father nor daughter could contain their joy, and everyone in the room was quite moved by their happy reunion. Malcolm looked like he had aged many years during his travels, and he explained that his expedition had gone off course and then become stranded in an unfamiliar place. There had been no way to send a letter, and they had lost the ship that would have brought them home. Edward had hired men to track her father's last known whereabouts. Communicating with local people and following clues, these emissaries of the prince had beaten a path to where Malcolm and his men were stranded. Edward had brought her father home to her, which was the greatest gift he could have possibly given on the occasion of their wedding. She tearfully apologized to Malcolm that she had not been able to keep the estate in order, but he told her that she had done magnificently, and he expressed regret that Lydia had allowed such a burden to fall on her shoulders. If anyone bore fault, it was Lydia and her daughters. And the question of what would happen to them was the next order of business. Malcolm's journey had not resulted in great wealth, and he was facing lean times on his estate. Lydia was greatly displeased at this, but she was his wife, and they would manage. As for Agnes and Imogen, Arabella decided that they should have a chance to redeem themselves. Feeling rather magnanimous, she offered them both places at the palace, although she thought it best if they were not in her personal entourage. After all, water under the bridge is easier said than done. Both girls saw the opportunity as a chance to pursue a new life, and as Arabella had hoped, a kinder one. So it was that Cinderella laid her past resentments to rest. Of course, no fairy tale could be complete without a glimpse of its happy ending. And you can rest assured that Arabella and her prince had that in spades. Their glittering wedding was the event of the decade. The most delightful people were invited, 
and the happy pair set off afterwards on a trip around the kingdom, where Arabella enchanted the people of one county after another. Edward also became quite close with Malcolm, who was rich in worldly experience, if not in funds. They spent many hours discussing the wonders of the world together, and respected each other greatly. This made Arabella very happy. You'll want to know if Arabella's fairy godmother ever appeared again. And of course, the answer is yes. She may have been more of a breath on the wind, or an unexpected strain of music in an empty room. But Arabella had the sense that she was always there, somehow. Even when the newly minted princess had to travel far from her mother's garden, the spirit of magic somehow came along. With it, she never felt alone, and she knew that her mother or godmother's love was always protecting her and helping her remember to be beautiful both inside and out. Rest assured, Cinderella and her prince most certainly, without a doubt, lived happily ever after. <laughs>